was fortunate enough to see today's speaker on Broadway in The Lion King. He performed in uh, Broadway's, or Disney's production of The Lion King and Broadway. Then, unbelievably, I had the chance to meet him in Columbus, Ohio, at a, at a client's house who were moving away. And this man, amazingly, such a kind and generous and phenomenally talented person, became friends with my, fr my client's son, who has Asperger's, long distance, right, Tom? This kid was just so thrilled about everything Disney. And so they developed a long distance relationship. And then lo and behold, Tom takes a position at Audubon College in the theater department as a teacher. So now he's local. So we're so lucky that we get to have him here locally. Anyway, he is not one of the most, he is not only one of the most talented actors that I've ever seen on stage, but he's one of the nicest human beings you will ever want to meet. He's just incredible. Tom Christopher Warren is a seasoned actor with over 15 years on Broadway, including iconic roles in The Lion King, such as Scar, Pumba, Zazu, and Timon. Did I pronounce those right? You did. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Tom has graced stages worldwide. And then, as I said, we were blessed to have Tom to come to, come to Columbus to be in the theater department at Audubon College. Tom is now li living his passion as a resident of Columbus. That's not the passion part. Performing here and throughout the country, serving as a performer, a director, and a theater coach. Today, Tom is gonna share with us his journey as a young actor to the Broadway lights and beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, Please give a warm welcome to, welcome to Tom Christopher Warren. Thank you, everybody. Hi, I'm Tom. Thank you for allowing me to wear jeans. <laughs> this hour, I think we're all lucky. I'm just wearing pants. Um, I really feel, I feel so uh, blessed to be here in a room with so many really remarkable service-oriented people. Thank you for inviting me and for allowing me access, I appreciate it very much. Uh, I'm not sure how compelling my story is to most, but here it is anyway. Uh, <laughs> as Joanne said, I'm an actor, I'm a director, a uh, college professor, now a writer. Uh, well, Chip, we'll have to talk later because I, I need to learn more about being a writer. <laughs> uh, and I moved here six and a half years ago, almost seven years ago from New York, New Jersey, which is where I spent the first 50, 40 day-ish years of my life. Uh, I grew up in Edison, New Jersey, which if anyone's familiar with Rutgers University, very close to there. And we're situated halfway between Philadelphia and New York. And that allowed me access to theater in New York to Broadway at a very early age. And that started my story. That's where I start in New York, New Jersey. Actually, I say New York to people because it's it's a shortcut. I never, I've never lived in New York in, in 54 years. It's sort of my dirty little secret. It's It's kind of weird. But I've always lived in New Jersey. I like my car. I like autonomy. So I like being able to get in and get out. Uh, and six years ago, I like being able to get out and not go back, uh, which is why I'm here. But I loved living where I did. I grew up with a single mother in the 70s. I never met my father. And my mother was wildly supportive, wildly liberal, uh, very, very intelligent and kind and was my best friend, actually, uh, but really did support all of my artistic ambitions. She couldn't sing, dance, or act herself, but she loved music. She loved listening to music. She loved people. She was a hostess at heart. That's really what she did. It was the 70s, so there were there were questionable parties for which I was shipped off to the grandparents, and then there were um, a lot of, we had a pools, so we had a lot of pool parties. We had a lot of, I had a vibrant social calendar uh, at age 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Uh, never with students my own age or kids my own age. It was always, I was always surrounded by uh, single adults who were, you know, navigating life in the 1970s, trying to find fellowship and, you know, partners. And uh, I loved that. I was the kid passing the hors d'oeuvres around at the party and I, I I think it's where I learned empathy. Any of my good qualities, if I had any good qualities, it's because of my mother um, and empathy among them. And the she loved hospitality. So the 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 joy found in cooking for friends and just fellowship and camaraderie that I learned from her and uh, hope to pass it on myself. 
But where I was, we were probably within 30 minutes of 30, 35 community theaters. And that's where I learned to love theater. Uh, I remember being taken to Radio City Music Hall every year for Christmas and Easter, because back then they did the Christmas show and the Easter show. Back then they showed a movie with the Rockettes and everything else, and it was a whole experience, and I fell in love with it. And I was probably 10 when I went to my first Broadway show. Actually, maybe even a little younger. Uh, Annie, if you're curious. And uh, short side, I don't always... Um, story tell in a linear fashion. So I apologize in advance, but I usually circle back if I don't catch me out. But uh, I remember uh, reading the liner notes on the album to Annie. I, I poured over it and I listened to that album. I wore it out. And on the liner notes, there were photos and there was a photo of little Annie with the orphans. Uh, and I was like, it's going to be that little boy orphan in the Long Johns. That's going to be me. I'm going to be the boy orphan on Broadway. And then I went to see it and I realized it was her pigtails were actually behind her head. So it was a little girl. I was filled with rage. <laughs> I really thought I was going to um, But I was, I was able to access the culture of New York, the museums. My mother was really great about just exposing me to um, all different kinds of creative opportunities, artistic opportunities. A lot of her friends were writers and artists. Um, and so I, just, I was a part of, even sometimes peripherally, conversations that allowed me access to creative thought and critical thinking, uh, which was, I realize now was a real gift. I didn't, of course, I didn't recognize it as a gift at the time. And I was a monster as a kid, but uh, <laughs> I was actually only a monster to my mother. I was, I was really great out in the real world to like civilians, but I was terrible to my mother. I made up for that later uh, after I learned. <laughs> and I started doing community theater. I got very involved in community theater in New Jersey. There were a, a really wide range of, uh, some of the theaters were better than others. Some had, some were larger than others. There was one that was fairly large. It was some, it was a summer theater, a large amphitheater, similar to uh, what we have here, Actors Theater in Schiller Park. Uh, but the, they have a, a, a permanent structure that's really massive. And at the time they were federally funded, which now is unheard of for a community theater but back then was already rare. And they had, there's a, a union for stage actors called Actors' Equity Association, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And uh, those union members had access to this theater. They had had several contracts per, per performance and we had a full union orchestra. And again, today, even on Broadway, you don't see a 25, 30 piece orchestra, but back then we had a 28 piece union orchestra for every show. And it was just a fabulous learning ground for me. Um, where I, I learned a lot of my formative lessons as a as an actor, how to behave in a rehearsal room, how to navigate group dynamics, how to problem solve, all of those early lessons I learned in theater and specifically in community theater, particularly this one. And joined the union when I was 16, which, yeah, like, like wow, great, or wow, because <laughs> <laughs> honestly, a little bit above, you know, uh, I was... So I mentioned Annie. So I went to, I don't even know if Joanne knows this, but Mickey Rooney, who you may or may not have heard of, had a, a school for an arts after school program in Azusa, California, and in Edison, New Jersey. <laughs> who knew? And so I went to Mickey Rooney's Talent Town. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that, that <laughs> as, as derpy as it sounds, but what Mickey did, and we, we, those of us who were there got to work with him a few times. We toured with him and he owned a bunch of hotels and we would perform with him in hotels. And we made a record, a 45 record. Mm -hmm. uh, President Jimmy Carter at the time, RIP Roseland, um, mm -hmm. very sad about that. Uh, he declared National Grandparents Day and we did this day. Somebody, somebody wrote a song, Grandparents. And uh, we recorded it with with Uncle Mickey, as he was referred to. Uh, and at that school, there were we our teachers, our voice teachers, dance teachers, theater teachers were all working professionals. So at by this point, I'm probably 13, 12, 13, 14, and I'm now working with people who were kind of putting a a, a, a vocation stamp to what I loved doing in community theater. I would go after school and I would rehearse, and it was all fun as it should be. And these folks were doing it and it was fun for them, but they were also making a living doing it. They were somehow supporting themselves and families. And I was able to you know, compartmentalize, oh, you can actually do this for a living. That's interesting. <laughs> Not that I was considering, you know, having to pay bills or anything like that at 12. <laughs> should have been, but uh, 
that school allowed me into the idea of, oh, Broadway is a thing that is attainable. I see. That's interesting. It, it sort of demystified it for me at a young enough age that it felt like an attainable goal. Uh, sometimes probably it felt too attainable from what reality was dictating, but still it, it felt like something that I could at some point reach and eventually did. And many of the little girls that I was in these classes with had all come off the national tour or the Broadway company of Annie. They all shared a manager, uh, Edie Robb, who was based in Philadelphia. And so I wound up getting represented by Edie as well. So by age 13 till I was probably 27 or so when I finally left Edie's management, I was managed by this talent organization. And so they would submit me for commercials and not a lot of theater. I did a movie, a terrible movie when I was uh, in my <laughs> early 20s. Terrible, terrible. Uh, but it, it also exposed me to the film industry. And it's when I joined Screen Actors Guild, which is the labor union for screen actors. And I'm no longer a member. But that experience was kind of formative in telling me, oh, this is what a film set looks like. This is how a film set functions. And I kind of hate every second of it. Um, money's great, but it's just there's the, the same joy was just not there for me in terms of the storytelling joy that I get from theater. Great lesson. Um, and it bought me my first car, so great. Uh, and every so often it still comes on and somebody catches a glimpse of me in a very tiny role. I, I worked the whole shoot as a standby for the, the, the lead so they would set the lights on me. But then I got a little day player role. So you can see me in it and it's uh, one of life's embarrassments, but it's still, it's a fun part of my past. And by the time I was with Edie and doing this more often, she said, you know, let's, let's have you join Actors Equity. I was 16. Okay, that's what everybody who does this, they're going to be on Broadway, you have to be a member of the, the labor union, so let's do it. Nobody was really telling me, you're, you're not quite cooked, right? You're, you're overweight, you've got bad skin, you've got a really lovely voice, but like, we don't know, what, you're not you yet. You haven't, you haven't figured out what you, the voice you want to share theatrically. Nobody said any of that. So I joined Actors Equity at 16 and I did a children's theater show uh, in Philly. That was my first equity show, Babes in Toyland. And uh, then I didn't work anymore. Then I, the, the industry was like, we're, you're not ready for us, we're not ready for you. But community theater was still wide open for me. So I was still learning and working with people my own age and above. Um, the only way to get better is by working with people who are better than you. And I was doing that regularly and I kept my eyes open and I kept my ears open. And that's how I grew. That's how I bettered myself as a storyteller, as an actor. I sort of figured out what I wanted my voice to be. And so I did a bunch of non-union tours. We can talk about the difference between union and non-union. Um, but it allowed me as a young actor to see the country, to go on the road. Uh, and it, it is how I saw the country. I, I have been, I think I've been in every state, not Alaska, uh, but every other state because of theater. And I owe a huge debt to those theater companies. One of the, one of which was the Nebraska Theater Caravan, which comes into play into my story um, now, weirdly. But I spent 91, 92, 93, the better part of three years in Omaha, Nebraska, working for the Nebraska Theater Caravan, which was remarkable. They hired actors on a yearly contract and you would do three shows. You would do a show for elementary school curriculum. You would do a show for high school curriculum and then you'd do a show for the community. And then you were teaching artists. So you also taught workshops and classes, master classes. And you worked with kids, both uh, K through six, uh, K through, I guess K through eight and then high school as well. And combining the teaching artist with the performer was a track that I, fit into nicely and I really enjoyed. So I did a lot of theater for young audiences as a young actor. I did a lot of master classes and in teaching, informal teaching, formal teaching, private coaching and stuff as a, a young actor and I loved it. By the time I was 20, oh, I don't know, seven or so, uh, I now I was starting to grow into my own. I was starting to become who I would be as an actor. I was, uh, I matured a little bit knew a little bit more about the world. I'd paid a few bills by this point, <laughs> um, imagine. And uh, so now I was auditioning for the, the bigger stuff. And there was a theater called, the, there is a theater called the Guthrie in Minneapolis. And it's one of the premier theaters in the country. And it was, it's a remarkable, this was in their old space, but it's a remarkable history laden theater. And they were doing, they don't often do musicals. They were doing Babes in Art. And it was all young actors. Um, myself, Kristen Chenoweth, Aaron Dilley, just some really, really fantastic young people. 
And an actor, uh, his name was Harold Klerman. And Harold was part of a vaudeville troupe company, a vaudeville team called Stump and Stumpy. Mm -hmm. And they had done the original Babes in Arms on Broadway in 1937, and Harold was hired for this. Mm -hmm. And Harold had his doctorate in dance history and just a remarkable human being. Ethel Merman was his eldest daughter's godmother. Mm -hmm. um, Bill Robinson, Mr. Bojangles, gave him his first job in, in theater. So if you were open to listening to this man's stories, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> tell me everything. I brought him, again, nonlinear. I was teaching music theater history uh, maybe 10 years ago and Harold was still alive. And uh, he, he was like, just a circle, um, but a tap dancer, like an incredible tap dancer. And so he would toddle into my class <laughs> and he would <laughs> with his feet. And then he, he would do it sitting down by this one because he was in his nineties. Oh. But hearing him speak to a group of students at musical theater and tell his stories about the origins of tap dance and his stories, just <laughs> sobbing. And so this Babes in Arms allowed me access to these, this level of talent and they'd spent, the Guthrie holds a record. It's the most money they've ever spent on a show. Also the most money they've ever lost. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> even at, even at 27, like, well, you spent your entire marketing budget painting a bus. It seems to me that <laughs> more people are gonna wanna know to come to see the show than are seeing that bus. But what did I know? And it was fantastic. Uh, it, it was so joyful and so exhausting. And it was a part of something, the first time I'd worked on something new, it was the old Rogers and Hart score that we knew and loved, Where or When, Johnny One Know, My Funny Valentine, the, oh, the parade of hits, but an entirely new book and a whole new script, all new characters. And so for the most part, we were trying something out, doing a brand new show. Mary Rogers, the daughter of Richard Rogers of Rogers and Hart, Richard Rogers wrote in Oklahoma, Carousel, all those old golden age shows. Uh, Mary was the head of the Rogers and Hammerstein estate, which owned the rights to the show, and she came and hated it. So the show went nowhere after that, but the friendships lasted forever. <laughs> and uh, then I wound up doing a show at the Paper Mill Playhouse and just gradually building my regional theater resume. And that's what I wanted to do. I, I loved regional theater. It was a sort of community theater amped up uh, with more money poured into it and more resources. And it was really lovely. And then I made my Broadway debut at 28, nine, something like that, uh, in a show called Once Upon a Mattress with Sarah Jessica Parker, pre-Sex in the City. So Sarah had, I had seen Sarah play Annie in Annie when I was eight years old had her autograph on the record, which I showed her later. <laughs> uh, and that show, they hired me. Anybody know what a, and you all know what an understudy is, right? When the lead is sick, there's an understudy steps in. So the show opened, um, I was not yet in the cast and it got terrible reviews and it was charming. It was really lovely, but the reviews were unkind and it had Sarah in it and she was not Sex and the City famous, but she was still known. So they decided to try to keep it open. And after a couple of weeks, they thought, okay, business is picking up. We can hire a couple more understudies. And so that's when I was hired along with a female presenting understudy. And so we missed the whole rehearsal process. And apparently the rehearsal process was a nightmare. I guess the director was a nightmare. He didn't want anybody to be funny. This was comedy, so there, there was conflict there. Sarah didn't feel cared for. Like there was just, a, it was sort of a perfect storm of not a lot of fun for most people. I missed all of that. So I showed up, I'm, I'm, I'm on Broadway. And, <laughs> I was just so excited to be invited to the party that none of the drama affected me in the least. I would sort of watch it happen and go, we're on Broadway. And that was a lesson that I learned to that that the the attitude with which you walk into a room is the first impression that stays with you. And I I watched the temperature of the company gradually warm up as they distance themselves from opening and those reviews and eventually the show found its humor and it was really quite lovely um it couldn't sustain that long we, we closed after i think nine months on my birthday i wasn't bitter at all and <laughs> but it did it, it it was the experience that i had hoped for my entire life working on Broadway, supporting myself, seeing, you know, my name on a poster was very, very exciting and seeing and sobering to see that not everybody around me shared the same enthusiasm. And that was, that was very eye-opening uh, in terms of the business of this business, but I did it. And 
then I did a bunch of other regional things. I got to do, well, one thing that may be of note was I, I did a, a mattress closed and the casting director, Jay Binder, felt really badly that Once Upon a Mattress was closing. And we got notice very, very last minute. I think we got two weeks closing notice. And so he was working on a new project written by Barry Manilow, something called Harmony. And so he was bringing in all of the Once Upon a Mattress cast to sing for this show, Harmony. And everybody was getting auditions but me. I think because Jay didn't know me well. I was the last one cast in Mattress. But they're all coming in saying, oh, my audition went well. My audition went well. Oh, my audition went really well. Great. And I'm thinking, gee, I'd really love to be a part of that. It's about an acapella, not acapella, but a six-part singing group in pre-World War II Germany. And fascinating story, true story. Apparently, the music was supposed to be really great. Somebody who had done an original reading was having a baby and couldn't come back. So they needed to audition the last component of this production that was going to happen in La Jolla, uh, San Diego, California, at the La Jolla Playhouse. So Jay brought in a few of us from the mattress cast, and I wound up getting cast and creating this role in a brand new musical written by Barry Manilow and Bruce Sussman at the La Jolla Playhouse, another one of the top th regional theaters in the country, uh, was really nothing short of remarkable. And I say to date, it's the best thing that I've been a part of. This show changed my life. I worked with <laughs> artists that uh, other actors that were at the top of their game and have only risen since then. Same with designers. And the show was really special. It, true story, it was my first principal role at that level. And so we developed it for probably, we, I didn't, I was in the cast, it's not like I was writing anything, but we developed it for probably 12 to 15 years. We were, I performed with Barry all over Madison Square Garden, Vegas. We, he would bring the six of us in our white tie and tails and we'd be parading behind him and then we'd sing and then we'd walk away and he would say, now give us money, you know, uh, to raise money for this show. And I don't know if anybody's sort of following what's happening on Broadway recently, but Harmony just opened on Broadway uh, this week. Not with me, obviously, <laughs> but having been a part of it for 15 years, the, the La Jolla production, pre-Broadway, workshops. Uh, we did a we did a reading of the show at this theater's no longer in existence. The Douglas Fairbanks Theater off Broadway uh, was a that whole complex has been raised uh, to, I think it's where the signature theater is currently. And this little 99 seat theater, we're gonna do an industry reading. So there are the producers at that point, we're gonna invite the top three Broadway theater owners in New York. And then we wanted to fill out the other 97 seats with friends. And they said very carefully, do not invite anybody who is critical. We want friends, we want people who are gonna clap, we're gonna laugh, we're gonna sob. We want people who just support the break. So this is the two hour, 26 hour reading. So we rehearsed for a week and a half, under rehearsed. We replaced the male lead, Danny Burstein with uh, an actor named Brian Darcy James. And there was too much choreography for by equity rules. You're not supposed to have any choreography for these readings, but we were all holding our scripts and moving and singing and dancing. It was very stressful. And so we show up on the day for 97 friends and uh, three theater owners. And we look out and the theater was as big as this room with the front row closer. And there's Elaine Stritch with her feet on the stage, Liza Minnelli, Shirley MacLaine, Sarah Jessica Parker, Matthew Broderick. It was Shirley, uh, 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 Barbara Cook. It was just one celebrity after another. And we we're all freaking out <laughs> and freaking out. And somebody says in front of Barry, you know, this was supposed to be friends. And he very innocently said, I invited my friends. <laughs> These were his friends. <laughs> we did, a, we did a, a, the show was then slated to go to Broadway. And this was now probably 16 years ago, 17 years ago. And we were rehearsing the show in New York. We were going to go to Philadelphia for our out of town tryout the Sunday before moving to Philly. So we'd rehearse the whole show in New York. Sunday, uh, we have one last rehearsal in the rehearsal room. Monday, we travel to Philadelphia. Tuesday, we start tech in Philadelphia. We were gonna run in Philly for a month uh, and then come from it. Costumes had been built, set had been loaded in. We're, we're in fittings. And that last Sunday in the rehearsal room, they gathered us together and said, as it happens, the producer was uh, committing federal fraud. Nobody had been paid. Shops hadn't been paid. The money that had been invested had been lost. And I'm looking at Barry in the corner of the room in tears, the director in the corner of the room in tears. Brian, our lead, had just had a baby. And so that that effectively shut down the show for a long time, like until the the rights, the licensing rights reverted back to the authors, the producer, the, the fraudulent producers 
rights had to expire. It was a long, it was a long battle, most of which I know nothing about because it's far above my pay grade. I just knew that the show that was the most important piece of theater to me ever had effectively died. And now to see it happening on Broadway and I was able to see the final dress rehearsal and I was able to see a couple shows after opening. And it's it's just, and it's remarkable that that particular story is being told currently in the state of our current world. It, it's remarkable timing. If you find yourself in New York, go see Harmony. Uh, and then as Joanne mentioned, I wound up getting cast in The Lion King and that changed my life. I spent 20 years, well, I just celebrated 20, one year, 2002, whatever that math is, 21 years. Um, with the show, I played Scar Zazu, Timon Pumba. I was the resident director for one of the national tours. I went to Shanghai to set up that production to be the children's director because we had six kids in that production. Um, I could do a TED talk just on that Shanghai production. It's remarkable. Just remarkable. Uh, it, travel, everything's about travel, right? You learn everything about who you are and your voice by going outside of the country go. Um, and so my time with The Lion King has been rich and fun and disappointing and exciting and lucrative and frustrating mm -hmm. by turns. I've loved every single second of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I just got back from two weeks in Mexico. Now I'm, I moved here seven years ago to join the faculty at Otterbein. I'm not there anymore, but uh, I spent six years teaching uh, on the university level, and I loved that. I love working with children. I, I love working with college children. That, that's really my like sweet spot age where they understand what they want to do to a degree. They also, to a degree, have an understanding of how difficult the industry is. So that's the age that I, I enjoy watching them learn who they are and get better. Uh, but Lion King has since called me back regularly. I'm very lucky. I happen to know a bunch of roles. I happen to have costumes that haven't been sent off to somewhere or, you know, just sort of falling apart. Uh, and it, Disney has treated me very well in terms of when they need coverage, they know to call me and they know that I will say yes at every opportunity I'm able. I've had to say no a bunch of times and it kills me. Um, but just getting back from two weeks in Mexico and seeing the show received there, three months in Hawaii and seeing the first time a big show came through Oahu and seeing that community embrace us with, you know, they, they talk about the spirit of Aloha, but I've never, I had never witnessed that. I had never put sort of tangible uh, access to it. And that was truly, truly remarkable. So my time with The Lion King has been great. It has been uh, very educational. I've grown up through my time. I mean, it's interesting to, I can't really age out of the roles that I play because you're covered in makeup and nobody really knows. And that's a very unique experience. People call it my government job because it, it, not every actor gets to spend their career working in a show that they know is probably not gonna close anytime soon. Once Upon a Mattress, we came in every single, they have to give you a week's notice. Uh, and we came in every single week and looked at the call board, looking for a notice. We're not there. Okay, we got another week. I mean, like truly every week. And with Lion King, obviously, I don't really consider when the show is going to. I'm sure it will, but uh, probably long after I'm dead. Hopefully, long after. Mm -hmm. um, so that that is my well. Okay, so then I moved here, and now I live in Columbus, mm -hmm. and I love it. And everybody, is, and when I stopped working at Audubon, I was saying, "Are you moving back?" <laughs> Absolutely not. I would go back temporarily to work, but this has become my home. I, I shortly after moving here met Joanne. I met someone named Edward Kerrigan, who's the artistic director of Short North Stage, and that became my second home here. I've had the honor to work there quite a bit on stage, directing, uh, and just sort of it, it, that spirit of Mickey and Judy. Hey, kids, let's put on a show. That's that's how Short North kind of functions behind the scenes. Everybody, you know, their 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 structure is sound, but there's more work that needs to be done by the number of hands that they have. So everybody's pitching in all the time. And that's the kind of theater I really love doing. Uh, and in the six years, six and a half years that I've lived here, I have found community here in the theater community. Uh, Phil knows, you know, we, we cross paths all the time. We see each other's work. We work with each other. We hear of each other's work. It's a very tight knit theater community here. And I, I love that. Uh, my house is very similar to the house I left in New Jersey, which I was I was happy to say goodbye to those taxes, so it was nice to say. <laughs> Joanne, you hear me? You hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and now my husband and I are here with our dog. We love it. We're working on uh, we're Short North Stage and Kappa, who is the presenter for the Broadway uh, series here in the, the Ohio, uh, combined forces to work on a new Christmas carol that opens this weekend. I wrote it and I'm in it. 
And so now I'm, it turns out I'm a writer, apparently. And I somehow love it. <laughs> I never thought I could or would. And, and now I'm sort of screwed. Uh, <laughs> I really dig it. And we're going to somehow put together this Christmas carol that's going to open on Friday. It's going to look gorgeous. It's going to sound gorgeous. Mm -hmm. We've got a, a, an original score written by someone named Tom Albert, and it's beautiful. So things are good. Things are exciting here in Columbus in the theater scene. And uh, I'm just grateful that you all invited me here. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, I'm happy to answer anything. I'm an open book, but thank you for allowing me access to Rotary. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, sure. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Yes, sir. Are there community or regional theaters here? Are there community or regional theaters here? Yeah, absolutely. So Short North Stage is this weird, there's a lot of community theaters and by community theater, I mean, typically no one is paid. Actors aren't paid. There might be a minimal staff that is uh, paid, salaried, but for the most part, it's volunteer. There is that here on a large scale. There's a lot of community theater and then there's a lot of um, semi-community theater. So Short North is this weird model that I've actually not seen anywhere else. You've got working professionals that they make their living doing this for a living. Uh, some in town, some from out of town. You've got hobbyists who do this strictly as a hobby. You've got high school interns. There's a whole internship program that exists within Short North Stage. And you've got folks who did it for a living and then they're expats. They moved back here to raise families or whatever. So you have this huge spectrum of folks who've been doing this their whole life, folks that they do it to support themselves, folks who just do it for fun. And everyone sort of cross-pollinating and learning from each other, which is really remarkable. And then we have regional theaters here too. The Contemporary Theater, uh, formerly CatCo, exists here. Shorter Stage is considered a regional theater. Um, uh, I would consider like Available Light to be a, re a regional theater, even though it's voluntary, it, it, it operates at such a high level. There's, It's a pretty vibrant scene here. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm the board chair of Kappa, and I oh. we have a board media night at four o'clock on the stage uh, itself, and we're super excited for the Christmas Carol this weekend. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. I feel like we can't have you end without seeing some part of the line. Oh, it's a terrible idea, but I'm all over you too. <laughs> <laughs> After two weeks of like, ah, my, my voice is trash. <laughs> <laughs> but. Yes, I'm all over YouTube. Find me on TC Dubs at Instagram or <laughs> copiesforwarren.com. <laughs> I saw hand raised over here. Yes. When did you first start in life? 2002, uh, October of 2002. And I started as Ed, if anybody's seen it, he's the hyena with the tongue who doesn't really say much. Uh, and I did a year as Ed understudying, at that point, Scar, Zazu, and Timon. And then they sent me to tour to understudy an additional guy. So now I was covering, but not playing Ed. It's the, that was hard on my body. You're like bent in half and you've got these arm extensions and you've got this contraption connected to your neck to make the puppet mouth open. And it's, <laughs> it's a little like this. And, uh, you know, particularly at 54, that's not one of the tracks I cover. <laughs> but yeah, so I did 15 years full-time, then left to move here and now I'm back and forth. So did you travel to London? Europe I've never been there? to London. I, I would... Honestly, do any English speaking production. I barely speak English, so going to a foreign <laughs> English production would be a trip. Uh, we did have a Zazu who came from the Spanish production. Um, they, they have a production in Barcelona, and he came, didn't speak a word of English, learned the entire role phonetically, and he was coming into Broadway just to do the show for two months. Somebody, Tom Schumacher, the head of Disney, uh, just sort of got it in his craw that he wanted to give this guy this opportunity. So he came. The nicest man you've ever met, not a single word of English, oh. not a single, I didn't speak any Spanish, so there's no judgment at all. It was just a delightful way to kind of communicate with someone through smiles and gestures and, you know, facial cues and body language. He was, he's fantastic. And I think he's you know, doing all kinds of big things back in Spain currently. Joanne. Um, this, the Christmas Carol that you wrote that's opening yeah. this weekend. It's a, can you explain, it's a collaboration between Short North yep. Stage and Kappa. Yeah. But I noticed online, it is going to play here this weekend and then it's touring? Yeah, 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 yeah. So this this Christmas Carol that's happening this weekend is a co-production between Kappa and Short North Stage. Kappa is a presenter. They bring all of them. You could certainly speak much more eloquently than I, but in my minimal uh, vernacular, uh, Kappa is a presenter. They bring all of the, the Broadway national tours through with the Broadway series. 
uh, they don't typically self-produce. Short North is a producer and they produce on the stage at the Short North stage in, in the Short North district at the Garden Theater. And so they, uh, the Nebraska Theater Caravan, with whom I worked in the early 90s, had a touring production of A Christmas Carol that came through for 30 years. And they, at, at in their heyday, were doing one main stage production in Omaha, a West Coast tour, an East Coast tour, and a Midwest tour, all at the same time. They rehearsed all four productions at the same time in the same space. So the Cratchits would all go into one room with one director. The Scrooges would all go into one room with another director. And it came together like this wild machine. Post pandemic, they no longer tour. They only have their production in Omaha. And so there was this hole in, in the, the, the Christmas season for uh, Kappa subscribers. And I think from what I understand, people reached out and said, we missed the story. Uh, can, we, can we bring them back? When it became clear that the caravan was no longer touring, at least not anytime in the future, Kappa approached Short North and said, would you be interested in putting something together? I found that out. Edward told me, uh, the short, the uh, artistic director, and I said, well, I'd love to write it. He said, great, I hate writing, but I'd love to direct it. Great. So we par we paired up that way. Kappa is um, the sort of financial umbrella under which we've existed. And Short North is providing the 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 manpower, right? That we wrote it, he's directing it. Uh, and we're rehearsing in this beautiful rehearsal room at the Ohio Theater. We're gonna be on this historic stage, which is, Really incredible. I played through with Lion King for three months back in the uh, early 2000s on that stage. And so it's really pretty incredible to be back on that stage all these years later. Uh, and Kappa also owns the Schubert Theater in New Haven. So we'll go to New Haven for Christmas week and do a couple of shows there. Um, sort of figuring out where the market still wants this story post the caravans touring. Did I get most of that right? Ish, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, he he can stay. Can you stay and take more questions? Sure. Right. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Did you want to ask him something? Just what was the title of your terrible movie in the seventies? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, it wasn't the seventies. Give me a break. <laughs> It's the 90s. Uh, Mannequin 2 is a sequel to the first Mannequin, which is great. Well, I've seen that. Oh, I have to for I mean, the first 10 minutes, you can't miss me. I'm wearing like Sally Jesse Raphael glasses. I don't know what I was trying to <laughs> Sadly. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, I have to admit, all the, all the presentations we have, always feel our left brain, correct? Left brain. It is so nice to hear someone uh, work on our right brain, being creative, and have a lot of fun doing it. So I really appreciate your coming today. And Joanne, thank you as well. Um, I want to keep the fun going. So I want to come bring up Mark Schieber, and he's going to talk about some happy bucks today. <laughs> 